Welcome once again as we continue to dig into Revelation and today we reach the next section of Revelation where significantly we're finding that there is a door standing open in heaven. John's being invited into heaven to see what the world looks like from there. And it's vital we don't miss this because it actually sets the scene for the rest of the book of Revelation. We're now in the heavenly places where God's kingly reign is right and true, good and perfect and unopposed. And from here we watch all that is going on in the world, on in the world where the place where, uh, by John's definition, is God's will and God's purposes are contested and challenged. So let's try and get our, our minds around that a little bit and away from kind of an up and down in terms of revelation, but into the idea of kingdoms or, or realms, that heaven is the place where God's will and purpose is obeyed and where God is worshipped and honoured and glorified as opposed to the world, where this is not the case. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't, but there's a contested uh, war, if you like, going on. This will help ground us as we go through the rest of the book of Revelation and helps us to keep an eye on the end where God's kingdom, the heavens uh, and the world itself, are redeemed and they all come together through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross as God renews both the heaven and the earth to make the new heavens and the new earth. The former things pass away. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We are in chapter 4 verses 1 to 6a. 6a just means the first half of verse 6. We'll pick up the second half next video. This is what it says. After this I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven and a voice I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby, a rainbow sh that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashings of lightning and rumble, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. And also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, as clear as crystal. John, having seen a door opened in heaven, is beckoned up by Jesus, the one who spoke to him like a trumpet back in chapter 1, verse 10. Now we're being let into uh, our reality from the other side what the normally unseen world that exists side by side with our world uh, is what we're being led into for a little while. Our eyes are being opened to see God's reality. So I hope that you are excited as we continue through this. This is what's going on. And in that world, that world from God's perspective, the first thing we see is that God is right at the centre. John is peering in. The humans are kind of on the periphery, but what they're looking at, the centrepiece, is God. This is important. The nature of sin the nature of sin is to sit on the throne that belongs to God and make the world all about us, ourselves, centred on us. But this, the true reality of what's going on in the world and in the heavens and the whole of the cosmos that God's created is that God is on his throne and he is at the centre of it all. Everything else is secondary. This can cause for humility from us as we learn about what's going on in the cosmos, in the world from God's perspective throughout Revelation. So there's a throne with someone sitting on it and everything seems to revolve around that throne. The one sitting on it has the appearance of Ruby and Jasper, John attempting to describe the wonder and the glory of God himself. This rainbow encircles the throne, shining like an emerald, proclaiming the wonder and the, in, in wonderful technicolour, really, the God's faithfulness to his covenant and his, uh, with humankind. We can back then to the to 24 more thrones, uh, uh, with each with an elder sitting on it, dressed in white, which you'll remember signifies their purity before God. They're wearing a crown of thorn. This uh, 24 elders probably represents the complete people of God, 24 being a combination of 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 disciples of the apostles. The complete people of God are being made pure by Jesus so that they can sit in the presence of God with crowns of gold, which represent some kind of mandate to rule as kings. They are actually being invited. We, God's people, are being invited into participating with God in the rule over his creation. Imagine that. Everything revolves around God, yet he invites his people, his church, into his ruling sphere. And whilst humankind is on the periphery as they should be, they and we are still in God's eye line. Not only represented by the elders, but the, set, the lamps are there in front of the throne. In essence, we have two mentions of God, of Jesus' church here. One in the form of the complete church and the 24 elders, and the other in the form of the lamps, which represent the church as it is on earth at the time. We encountered those lamps before in chapter 1. Uh, 
Then we have the glory. So then we have uh, coming from the throne, the lightning and the thunder, the glory of God. The magnitude of God's glory is such that, that it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming all that's going on. Here it's as if God's throne is kind of fizzing with glory. It's, it's kind of exploding with glory and honour and majesty and wonder. It can't be contained, so it bursts out in thunder and lightning. The whole fullness of God is here on the throne at the centre, which is what we're being told uh, by the, the mention of the seven spirits of God. God's fullness, seven being complete and full. God is here. And then in front of the throne, there is a sea of glass, as clear as crystal. In the metaphorical language of Revelation and, and uh, the other uh, apocalyptic books back in the Old Testament as well, uh, the sea represents chaos, unruly, dangerous, chaotic. Much like the empty and the formless deep that the Spirit of God hovered over right at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, a, a sea that needed some kind of taming and bringing into order so that the good and glorious order of God's creation could be, uh, could be produced by God's word. So here we see that the sea isn't any more chaotic. It's still, it's tranquil like glass and crystal. God's very presence brings order out of chaos. The forces of chaos are stopped. God is present. God is all-powerful. Our history, our world, from God's perspective, which John is telling us is the true perspective, the actual reality, whereas our perspective from our own world is murky and somewhat indistinct. The world from God's perspective is wholly under God's control, subject to his glory and his majesty, and will, in the end, come to bow down and worship the one true God. We are meant here as we start chapter 4, to have our imaginations utterly overwhelmed by the scene that's presented to us. Everything exists for God's glory. What impact that has on us, day by day, needs to be massive. We are here to serve God. He doesn't exist to serve us. We have no rights before God. We aren't in control of our lives. And what's more, that is okay, and absolutely as it should be. We exist for the sake of the glory of God, and we're Pausing halfway through verse 6, so there's more to come.